Okay, play the intro. Ant facts. Facts about ants and other insects, but mostly ants. Yup, that's right. Ant facts are here to stay. And because of that, I am going to need a new ant fact intro eventually, because that one is already annoying the hell out of me, and I'm the one that recorded it. So if anybody out there wants to make, like, a really quick five-second ant fact intro and, like, send it to my Twitter, I will accept it graciously. Okay, so this one is actually something I've known for a while, and it's a really interesting idea. It's not really involving ant species specifically. It's about how there's other insects, and mostly spiders, that mimic ants okay so there's a bunch of ant mimicking spiders and that always like you know uh confused me at first because i'm like spiders are like typically big and they got venom and the fangs and they're all scary and everything why would a spider want to mimic a tiny little frail ant because ants are actually very scary when it comes to like various predators like birds ants you know can secrete acid and they taste horrible and they obviously come in large numbers whereas spiders are mostly by themselves so it would make a lot of sense why a lot of spiders would want to disguise themselves as ants. Sometimes they do it with the pheromones, sometimes they actually disguise themselves as it, and you can obviously tell because spiders only have two body segments and uh, insects and ants have three body segments, and so if you look up close you can definitely spot the difference, but a lot of times you really can't at a distance, right? We think of ants as like these little frail things that you can just like crush and they're just like, you know, mildly annoying or whatever, but for a lot of the rest of the insect world and a lot of like the birds and stuff that prey on them, and there's probably a few birds that have evolved to eat ants, you know, they're not harmed by the acid or anything, but in most cases, it's probably better to, uh, become an ant, as because ants are a little bit more of the safe species, you won't get eaten, rather than spiders, where a lot more birds and things will prey on spiders, so not really so much about ants specifically, but ant mimicry that exists, and it's not just, uh, spiders, it's also, like, here's a beetle that, uh, mimics an ant, there's also flies out there that do it, so it's probably the most mimicked insect species, maybe the most mimicked species in the entire world, I'm not really sure, but, um, there's your ant facts. Yeah, ant fact for the day. Okay, so today's video is going to be about Sora Umi no Senshi, the warrior of the sea, the hero of the north, the south, the east, the west, and the grand line all together. He fights for truth. He fights for justice. He is truly their Superman, okay? So I love the concept that during Totland, we had a lot of stuff going on at Totland at once, okay? I remember when we were making that jump from Zoe to Totland that like Oda was juggling a bunch of stuff. Stuff. Okay, so we not only had Big Mom involved here, one of the Yonko, this was her proper introduction, we also had, oh by the way, Sanji is a prince to a kingdom, but not just a regular kingdom, a kingdom of evil from the north, called the Jerma Double Six. By the way, they're all Power Rangers, okay? So that was enough right then and there, but then you also get the whole thing involved that's like, no, there's actually this comic strip in the World Economic Journal, that's the published, you know, by Morgans and everybody, that features this dude named Sora, Warrior of the Sea, and the Jerma are actually the enemies of Sora in the comic books. So there was like a bunch of stuff going on here, and looking back on it when I made this video, you know, Oda didn't even need to include that last part. He did not have to include this whole little segment about there being a comic strip from the North having a guy named Sora in it. You know, why did that even need to exist? It could have been the whole structure of Tauntland, like, here's Big Mom, she's a Yonko, also Sanji is a member of this evil kingdom from the North, and we could have filled in the rest of the gaps ourselves. But I love the fact that Oda did this, because for number one, it expands the world of One Piece in more ways than you might think. I mean, it's just little details like that. Like, well, yeah, there is a newspaper, there's a global newspaper that exists in the One Piece world um, that's carried by the news coup all over the planet, okay? So, it would make sense that in the newspaper, on top of, you know, very important articles about various islands and, like, what the revolutionaries are doing and what the Yonko are doing, it would make sense there'd also be, you know, like, the funny pages. I kind of am curious about some other comic strips that would be running in the World Economic Times. Like, what's the equivalent of, like, Hagar the Horrible or, or Garfield? Is there a One Piece equivalent of Garfield. <laughs> like, I'm curious. Like, it can't all be serious, like the Phantom or whatever. There has to be some funny ones in there too, right? So, that expands the world a little bit. Like, yeah, they have a newspaper. They would, of course, have comics, but it expands it even more when you understand what Sora, the warrior of the sea, even is. 
It is a massive, massive propaganda campaign to get children interested in joining the Marines and the world government to fight for them, continuing the kind of expanse that the world government has on the entire One Piece planet, all right? Because little kids all over the world are reading the comic book, and they're like, wow, this Sora, the, the warrior of the sea, he's so cool. He's got a badass outfit. He's got a laser gun. He's got a seagull for a hat. He's got a talking transforming robot i'm gonna join the marines too i wonder what rank you have to be to get your own talking transforming robot whatever i'm gonna join the marines to find out okay mom that's what i'm gonna do when i grow up right and you know what the crazy thing is probably a lot of kids in the one piece world that is where their interest started in the marines and then they eventually grew up and did join the marines i would actually be kind of curious i would i'd like to see certain marines talking about how like oh yeah i joined ever since i was interested in the marines when I was a kid when I first read Sora, Night of the Sea. By the way, the name Sora, sometimes it's also Sola. It's the same issue with Sanji's mother who shares the name, and we'll get to that in a second. Um, both are actually kind of phonetically correct because L's and R's are pronounced very similar in Japanese, but just going by the katakana characters, we have So and then Ra. So Sora is probably the correct term with an R. Okay. What is exactly the connection here between the Germa? Like, did the comic book come first, or did the Germa come first? Like, how exactly did this happen, okay? Because they look exactly alike. I mean, there's some slight differences with the character designs and all that, and some of the color palettes are not right, but overall, it's pretty much the exact same thing, right? So, I like to think, and we, we understand that the Germa came first and the comic book was based on that, um, but what I like to think is that I think it was like 300-something years ago that Judge said that the Germa first rose to power, okay? And they ruled over the North Blue territory for 66 days, which is where they got the name Germa Double Six, okay? So that was like centuries ago that that happened, all right? So that happened, and they ruled, and then they fell. We don't exactly know, I guess, the other, you know, ruling factions of the North, or maybe the world government got involved and, like, crushed them or whatever. But they had their 66 days of power, and then they lost that, and they kind of faded into the annals of history, okay? And I do not think that the Germa continued to exist during that period. I think it died out, and then a few hundred years later, Judge was born, who was the descendant of those original rulers, and he wanted to fulfill the wish of his ancestors and, you know, make the Germa rule over all of the North Blue. Okay, so that was his goal. But for a good few hundred years there, the Germa did not exist, and they were just pushed into the back of the history books. Like, oh yeah, at one point in the North Blue, there was this kingdom, they tried to rule everything, they got crushed after like two months. Not a big deal. So, during that period, is probably when Sora, Knight of the Sea, not Knight of the Sea, I always want to say Knight of the Sea, but that's Jinbei's epithet, not Sora. Sora is Umi no Senshi, the warrior of the sea. Warriors and knights, very different, okay? But that's probably when, I don't know if it was Morgan's or maybe the previous editor of the World Economic Journal, I don't know how long it's been published, but everybody seems to apparently know about it. Um, it's important to mention that even though it was said that the comic existed in the North, it's printed in the World Economic Journal journal. So unless that Morgan's publishes different issues for each of the four blues, which I guess is possible. Here's like the North Blue edition. Here's the East Blue edition. But it seems to imply no. It's just one edition that is sent all over the world, okay? With the news coup providing transportation. So with that being the case, it might have been that the Sora uh, Warrior of the Sea comic is the most popular in the North because that's rooted in their history. So the people of the North Blue, probably more than the rest of the people in the world, know about the Germa, and so when they started reading Sora, they're like, oh, okay, it's rooted in our history, that's nifty. So they're the ones that like it the most, but it's also published all over the world, probably inspiring uh, with propaganda, all these other Marines and young members of the world government, you know, all over the place, okay? So that's kind of the situation we have there. Um, Vito, a member of the Fire Tank Pirates, is a huge fanboy of the Germa. There was even a filler episode when Luffy and Brooke were getting dressed at Beiji's Manor on uh, Whole Cake Island when they're looking for a thing to wear and then Luffy pulls out literally a, a cosplay of the giant robot. I don't think the giant robot has a name. It's just a giant transforming robot. It can, you know, um, you know, spawn ships for feet and it can sail around the ocean and it can turn into like a jet ski and then Sora's riding around on it, taking out his laser gun, like shooting down the members of the Germa. You know, it's a really interesting kind of concept. Like if anime were to exist in the One Piece world, Sora would have probably 
probably the best numbers there. Sora might be the One Piece of the One Piece world in terms of like readership or whatever. Who knows, right? And so, yeah, I mean, like, if you're going, if the world government is going to sit down and come up with a concept to be like, okay, we need an aspiring figure. We need like a Superman kind of character here that uh, all the kids of the world are going to read about and get them interested in joining the Marines. We want to instill in them at a young age that the Marines are objectively the good guys. The world government is objectively good and they fight for justice, okay? So they had a little bit of a flair here, you know? It's like, okay, well, we got to have them have a really cool outfit. I'm like, all right, so give them a really cool outfit. Uh, what else do kids like? Uh, Ray guns. Give him a ray gun. I'm like, all right, he has like a, a blaster gun or whatever. A blaster pistol like Han Solo. That's pretty good. Give him a seagull companion and give him a seagull on his head because the seagull is the universal symbol of the Marines. So like every day when the kids open up the paper, they see, you know, Sora with the head of a seagull and they're like, oh, that's the Marines right there. Also, the symbol that Sora has on his uh, outfit is a combination of the world government symbol like the cross and the Marine symbol of the seagull. Also, when we first were introduced to Sengoku, when he popped out at that meeting after Alabasta, when they were discussing what to do after Crocodile was defeated, uh, Sengoku was wearing a very large seagull hat, which I just assumed is the hat that you wear when you're a fleet admiral. Sengoku doesn't always wear it, and he doesn't wear it anymore now that he's just a general inspector. Um, but we don't see uh, Sakazuki wearing it, which, I mean, come on, Sakazuki! You are the fleet admiral now. It would have been really funny if after Sakazuki defeated Aokiji and he came back to Marine HQ and he's like, he's all beaten and frozen, but he's like, I beat Aokiji. He left. I'm the new fleet admiral now. Things are gonna change. And then Son Goku walks up to him just eating crackers and he's like, that's cool. Here's your hat. He's like, I'm not wearing that. And he's like, you got to, man. You're the fleet admiral. <laughs> Things are gonna change around here. You know, okay, that would have been pretty funny. But that's Sora's outfit, okay? So he's got a seagull companion, and he the last the last touch there was like, oh, he needs something else, something else for the kids. We need some merchandise for them to buy also, you know, to give us money. So it's like, let's let's uh give him a robot companion. I'm like, okay, he has a robot now, it's cool. And the robot can transform. Why not? Why wouldn't it be able to transform? Of course, okay? So anyway, yeah, the actual plot we don't really know other than the fact that Sora, Warrior of the Sea, travels around and he occasionally fights against the Germa Double Six. Those are like his major antagonists. Those are like the Team Rocket to his Ash Ketchum, alright? Which, considering the Germa Double Six in the comic are clearly the bad guys and you always have to see Sora come out ahead, um, it might be possible the Germa might be portrayed like Team Rocket or whatever. You know, like, Sora is traveling the seas in his jet ski robot with his mighty seagull companion, and then all of a sudden this giant mechanical fortress, like the Legion of Doom, rises out of the ocean, and then the Germa are there, and it's all really dark and foreboding, and there's, like, lightning in the background, but then they do, like, prepare for trouble, Sora, and then, like, the, the comic book equivalent of Reiju pops up and, like, make it double, and then all the other brothers come up, and then it's like they're, they're threatening, but they're also really wacky and goofy and silly. Meanwhile, Sora is really serious. He's like, ah, you nefarious villains! I shall take you down with my mighty weapon! And it's like a situation where it's like, like in Pokemon probably a lot, where Team Rocket might get the jump on Ash. He's like, we've developed a giant net that can absorb your Pikachu's electricity! We shall take the Pikachu now! And then it's like, Bulbasaur, use Razor Leaf. <laughs> Probably something like that, where they get the jump on Sora, and it's like, oh no, Sora, how's he gonna get out of this one? And it's it's probably full of so much, like, deus ex machina or whatever. Like, you know, there was one we saw in the anime where the Germa all kind of gang up on Sora, and they, like, blast him with their different rainbow attacks or whatever, and Sora's being trapped and he can't get out. And he's like, ah, oh, how do I escape? And then, like, you can actually hear the narrator coming on and just like, and Sora is in a tight spot, ladies and gentlemen. Thankfully, he remembered to eat his Wheaties this morning, brought to you by the world government, so he was able to fight back by the power of a balanced breakfast. And, you know, he defeats all of the Germa. That is probably the bullshit that happens in the comic, if we're being straight up. It's like, every week, it's probably very repetitive. Every week, the Germa come up with some new super weapon. Like, we've developed an anti- we've developed an EMP to defeat your robot. But it's like, thankfully, the robot is plated with a 
um, a world governmentium, the strongest metal on the planet that can only be, you know, acquired if you join the world government, so you better today. You know, it's probably some crap like that. Probably not written very well, but the point of it is not to have a really great story. The point of it is to get people to join the Marines and be as awesome as it can along the way. There's probably a whole toy line of Sora and his robots and whatever. I also like to think that Sora probably also fights against pirates in the comic, and that led me to think, like, whoa, okay, the Germa are probably, like, his main enemies, but I wonder if the world government takes the most infamous pirates of the day and puts them in the comic book, like Kaido and Big Mom and Shanks and Blackbeard and even Luffy and some of the other members of the worst generation, like, this week in Sauron, uh, not Knight of the Sea, Warrior of the Sea, he fights against the most dastardly villain ever, Monkey D. Luffy, the son of Dragon the Revolutionary. And then there's, like, a very warped version of Luffy in the comic comic book and he's like, <laughs> I'm here to take over the world with my stretchy powers. And then Sora shows up and he's just like, ah, Monkey D. Luffy, you nefarious devil. I have anti-rubber um, gum. Come and attack me if you dare. And he's like, ah, gum gum pistol. And he blows a bubble and it comes in contact and Luffy's arm just like explodes. And Sora's like, ha ha, bam. And then <laughs> defeats Luffy with one punch. And that's like the end of the comic for that week. There's probably additions where he fights the Kaido arc, the Big Mom arc, you know, where Sora single-handedly invades Totland and he defeats all of um, Big Mom's children. He's there. And it's like a little caption at the very end of it that's like, you could be the Marine. That Like, this is just a dramatization. The true nefarious Big Mom still lives and you could be the Marine to join today and stop her plans. You know, and at the bottom of every comic there's like a little Den Den Mushy number, you know, call the recruiting hotline for the, for the Marines and the world government today. It's very similar to the way actual comics probably worked in our world during the time of like World War I and World War II. Like World War I, there was a lot of American comics that like just did nothing but shit on the Kaiser, you know, Kaiser over in, you know, Germany. During World War too, we had all the Disney animations that existed as like newsreels that would play before movies. So the way people would get news back then is, you know, they, they, not everybody had a television, they had radios, but you would typically go to a movie theater or a movie palace, what they would maybe call them back then. And you'd sit down, and before the movie, it would play a newsreel. Like, here are the boys overseas, you know, fighting in Germany. You know, but you would also see maybe cartoons of, like, Disney characters like Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck joining the war effort, okay? So it's probably similar stuff that you would see in Sora, Night of the Sea. That might be how the world government, like, gets... Now, of course, when you come to, like, pirates like Big Mom and uh, Kaido, they are trying to take over the world. Like, they literally are trying to do that. Um, but other pirates like Shanks and... Uh, uh, you know, Luffy, they don't have that kind of ambition, all right? But probably all the same, you want to get it instilled early on in the public's head that the pirates are the objective evil of the world and the Marines and the world government are the objective good in the world. And what better way to paint that black and white worldview than with a comic strip? All right, that's probably the best way to do it, right? It's just, you know, Sora is the Superman. He does everything by the book. He's a great soldier of the Marines. And then you have uh, the pirates like Luffy and Shanks that are out there committing all these horrible crimes and probably, you know, lied about, you know, honestly, like, oh, yes, Monkey D. Luffy. Word is he burned an entire island down. Sora, you're the only one that can stop him. You know, it's probably going to be stuff like that that shows up in the comic. I actually kind of want to see more of that. Like, if Oda... Uh, Oda already has enough stuff on his plate, but if he ever did, like, a cover series, it's just an anthology. An anthology of adventures of Sora, Warrior of the Sea. That would be pretty cool. Like, everyone is just, like, a little uh, panel or, like, three panels of what the comic would be in the actual economic journal of, like, the stuff that Sora got up to and everything like that. Plus, I also kind of want to see that talking, transforming robot in action more. Like, are there other robots that he has? Probably. You know, there's probably going to be a moment where he assembles a super team together and whatever, and he has, like, a giant Megazord to fight against the Germa's giant Megazord. There's probably crossovers and all that stuff. I'm sure there's a lot of wacky nonsense in the comic book, right? Um, and like I said, at the end of the day, 
Oda did not even need to do this, all right? It, this was an excessive thing. He just like, Thailand doesn't need to, you don't need to have this comic book included, right? Even the whole thing with Stealth Black, like Sanji getting the suit and everything like that, it could have been included perfectly fine without getting the comic involved because the original Germa did come first, right? And so I feel like that was there so Law would know what Stealth Black is. Hawkins and Drake also come from the North, so they would know about it as well. Um, but it's just, it adds more flavor. It adds more world building to this uh, universe where it's like, no, this is a comic strip that everybody in the North would have known about. And it's like literally taking the concept of like Power Rangers or Super Sentai in our world and giving them physical reality. It would, it would be like, imagine you're walking down the street one day and then, you know, someone's being robbed or mugged or carjacked right in front of you. And you're like, oh no. And then all of a sudden the Power Rangers show up. Like, le legitimate. Like, the Power Rangers just show up on the scene and save the day. And you're like, and a Mighty Morphin, of course. Maybe Zeo. Actually, I like in space. You know, the, the Space Rangers show up. Okay, Andros shows up. The Space Rangers are there. And it's like, holy crap, you're real? And the Power Rangers are like, yeah. Like, based on real events. We're actually, we're out there protecting the cosmos. All right, now we got to meet the Galaxy Rangers for lunch. So, see ya. <laughs> and you're just standing there in the street like, what the f what what happened? How? You know, that would be like the equivalent in the One Piece world when Law saw Sanji transform into Stealth Black. That's like, okay, what? <laughs> that outfit, he's... Okay? <laughs> you know, Law was like flabbergasted by that. Same thing with Drake and Hawkins. They were like, what? That would be like Sanji just transforming into like the green Power Ranger, pull out the flute and summon the Dragon Zord out of nowhere. By the way, like just as we're talking about Power Rangers, as you do, um, the Dragon Zord never, uh, never got destroyed. It's still down there. It's still sleeping midst the, the ocean. I always wanted that thing to come back. I always wanted there to be... I knew there was never going to be, but I always wanted there to be, like, an episode where, like, they revive the Dragon Zord and it comes back. Um, but no, it never got destroyed, so remember that. It's probably in a comic somewhere or whatever, but as we're talking about Power Rangers, okay? Um, so yeah, I mean, like, I just wanted to talk about Sora because it's not going to be an important part of the rest of the story. It'll probably get brought up every now and then by characters. Um, it's like Oda's attempt at creating pop culture within his own creation, all right? So adding more flavor to the universe, which I absolutely love. So there'll probably be other stuff involved there. Like when you find out like, hey, what do the citizens of the One Piece world just do when they're like just regular civilians, when they're not pirates or revolutionaries or Marines, when they're just chilling out on their islands, what do they do? Do they just farm all day? Um, I guess. Uh, they, they run their bakeries, of course. You know, like, 95% of all the civilians in the One Piece world run bakeries. It's the most lucrative business in the entire planet. Um, but, like, you know, what do they do for entertainment? You know, what kind of music exists in the One Piece world? That was something else that Oda explored with, uh, Brooke, with Soul King. You know, they sell the TDs, the tone dials, and it's a hit all over the world. And he was, uh, a big starter of soul music. But that also implies that there's other genres of music that exist in the One Piece world. We know Bink Sock is like an old sea shanty from back in the day. Um, but there's probably other sea shanties, right? Like there, there's a One Piece version of, you know, the Weller Man or something. Or there's like One Piece Rock or One Piece, you know, J-Pop or whatever. There was that, um, you know, Django's Dance Dance Paradise on Mirabal Island that sang that song from Folder 5. So that's canon in the One Piece world, right? So people listen to music. They have their comic books that they read. You know, I wonder if there's a, there's a One Piece equivalent of Bleach. <laughs> it's like, man, I like Sora, Knight of the Sea, but um, I like reading Bleach. That's also another popular manga there. Uh, there was also the uh, chapter that Naruto ended in Weekly Shonen Jump. There was the cover page Oda drew where Luffy was eating with Naruto across the table. So maybe there's a Naruto that exists in One Piece, right? And also by that logic, in the last chapter of Naruto, Kishimoto drew the Straw Hats Jolly Roger on the Hokage Mountains as Boruto was vandalizing them. So, I guess One Piece exists in Naruto as well. It, the, the Jolly Roger was there, so there you go, right? So, you know, it's just a little thing, like, what exists pop culture-wise in the One Piece world? It's not gonna play a relevant role. The Straw Hats are gonna go find Laugh Tale. Those are gonna be bigger things, but like, you know, adds a little bit more stuff to it. Anyway, that was the video. I hope you guys enjoyed, and I hope you enjoyed the Ant Facts, definitely. But, um, yeah, this will be Techie 101 and Barry signing out. Onward, Sora! Warrior Knight of the Sea! Now that works. Warrior Knight of the Sea. Let's go with that.